Hello world, my name is Tim Russell, and welcome to the Dev Report, where we go over everything that happened last week in game dev right now. We got a lot of interesting stuff. We got we got hundred million dollar grants from Epic. We got some crazy news about how Epic might be tracking you. We got a uh, free 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 stuff from Nintendo. We got a lot of stuff. So if you wanna see more of this, stick around. Number one in the spotlight today, we got Epic Games CEO offering a hundred million dollars in grants for video game creators. Now, if you ain't heard. This billionaire says the world needs more video games, and he's putting his money where his mouth is. Tim Sweeney, founder of Fortnite, developer Epic Games, is offering $100 million worth of grants with, quotations, no strings attached, to Game Brainiacs. The program, or Epic Mega Grants, is our way of sharing Fortnite's epic success with others. Sweeney said at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, the grants, which will be as small as 5,000 or as large, did we go over this last time? I feel like we've covered this already. Maybe it's just been a, a really crazy week. Um, the grants, which will be as small as $5,000 and as large as $500,000, are up for grabs for video game creators, filmmakers, and educators, people whose work will benefit the whole digital content creation ecosystem. Now, this is really interesting because, I mean, I think it's safe to assume that there's there might be a little bit of a bias towards Unreal Engine since uh, Epic owns Unreal Engine. Uh they don't say that they say no strings attached but let's be real here they probably might maybe possibly potentially uh favor uh unreal engine here uh but i think it's interesting what do you guys think it's really great to be honest more creativity all we like 100 if i was a billionaire i would do this i would totally I, there are so many game great games that will never get made because people uh you know they got to go to jobs they got nine to fives they got shit to do they got to work they gotta they gotta put all of their creativity and effort into uh other people's creations not theirs um couldn't that lead to anti-competitive issues what you mean legally i don't fucking know i'm not a lawyer i don't know man yeah that's you know that's that was the common opinion last week i don't know man I don't know, man. Next up, Apple announces its own game subscription service, Apple Arcade. Apple Arcade. Apple Arcade. Apple has announced its own game subscription service, Apple Arcade, as a pay-for-access library of premium games for Apple platforms. During a live stream event today, Apple detailed what the subscription service has to offer and shared a look some of the developers it's already working with to get the platform off the ground. I did not read that wrong. It is written wrong and shared a look some of the developers. <laughs> Services due out in the fall in more than 150 countries and regions, but Apple has yet to announce anything on pricing quite yet. Now, this is interesting. So so last week we talked about the um, Google Stadia, right? And one of my concerns was, how is how's the pricing gonna work for Stadia? Is it gonna be playtime? And a pay for access library of premium games, which is pretty much just like the Xbox Game Pass, Netflix for games kind of thing. And it's interesting. It's interesting because how do developers get paid? They don't they don't talk about that. And I believe I could be wrong about this, but I believe they actually mentioned this in a different article so don't quote me on this but i believe that they said it was a percentage of playtime uh which you know again i don't you know if if call of duty is is on this system well call of duty won't be on apple but let's say a, a game equivalent to call of duty, or fortnite right fortnite's mobile what what if that's on this system? Fortnite's free again. Really bad example. <laughs> I should stop coming up with examples. But let's say there's a Fortnite type game that's on the system, that's gonna take all the revenue. There's gonna be no more, no more left. They did say that. Okay, good. Screw Apple. Just my opinion. But that said, I would still post my game there, just like Walmart. Yeah, we we need to get on that Walmart service. <laughs> we need to get on that Walmart service. I'm not sure I'd be up for like as a consumer, but depends on pricing, I guess. I mean, I get the appeal, right? Like I love Netflix. I love paying nine bucks a month for no advertisements, no bullshit. Uh, just whatever's on there, I watch. And there's always something for me to watch on there. And I like it. 
I would like something for games. I'm not I'm not a parent either, but I can totally see that working like really well for parents. Like, here you go. If you want to play a bunch of games, here's all the games you can play rather than have your kid like buy games over and over again or something. Um, I think as far as customer appeal goes, it makes a lot of sense. That's another thing. Like me and my brother, we hang out like probably once a week and play video games as like a catch up thing, more of like a we're going to be on the phone and kind of talk. So we might as well visually stimulate ourselves while we're doing it. Um, just kind of like a hangout and catch up because we're like 3,000 miles away from each other, right? Uh, Game Pass is great for us because we're like, oh, let's try this one. Oh, let's try this one. Let's try this one. So we don't have to like pay for all these different games. It makes a lot of sense, especially since most of the games we play for like 45 minutes and then we never play them again. I love Netflix too, but games seem different for some reason. Uh, well, they are different, but I wonder if the same model can work. And, and two, I wonder if the developers are not going to get fucked over. Because the difference between like Netflix and something like this too, especially if Apple announced that they're going to pay based on playtime, that's way different than how Netflix pays. Netflix pays a lot of money up front to acquire libraries of stuff. They pay you money up front. And I, I believe Xbox does that too. Again, don't quote me on that. I don't know shit. I'm just a dude on the internet. Uh, but you know that, okay, that makes sense. Like so near, near the end of your game's lifestyle, you're not life cycle. You're not selling much, many games, right? You want to get a little more money out of it. Microsoft will give you 10, 20 grand or something like that to put it on the service for six months or a year or something like that. That, that could totally make sense. But if my game's got to compete with like games that are literally designed with clinical psychologists to be addictive, which a lot of iOS games are, by the way, if you don't know that, you're kidding yourself. There's a lot of very well-made AAA games that are designed with clinical psych psychologists, PhDs, literally designed to keep you clicking. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm really not excited about the pay developers by playtime concept. Yeah, that's my only complaint promotes one of a kind one kind of game over others like you said fortnite kind of game over monument valley 100 100 percent. next up minecraft update removes mentions of creator notch from splash screens so this is one of those things that doesn't really affect any of us nobody really like this isn't a big deal but a lot of people were upset about this a lot of people went cray cray over this so as you know notch is the creator of minecraft he built mojang the whole company that did it and he sold it to Microsoft for billions of dollars, billions with a B and Microsoft now owns it. And they removed any mention of notch from the splash screens, which they have the right to do. Let's be real. They own it. They can do whatever they want, but you know, it's, it's fucking notch erase. Well, I don't know if it's erasing history as much as it's, just kind of i don't know like i mean has he been involved with the game for years at this point has he said something controversial i don't think so like yeah they 2.5 billion dollars in 2014 i didn't realize it was that that was five years ago peeps like i get why people would be upset like I might have the feels, right, if I sold my game and then they remove any mention of my name. But then again, I would kind of expect that if I sold my game. And especially if I made out with billions of dollars, let's be real. <laughs> I'd be like, ah, oh, that would hurt my feelings. But $2.5 billion, though. $2.5 billion, though. I don't think it's about discrediting him for the game. I, I mean, he's still in the credits, isn't he? They just removed it from the title screen. He sold the game. He doesn't own it anymore. Microsoft should have removed his name when they bought it. I mean, yeah, I don't really see a... I get why people might be upset, but I don't... I'm not upset by it. Like I said, I would have expected that if I sold... I sold my game. Like, when I sold my company, they removed everything about me. I expected that. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Next up, I found an article about the best slides I saw at GDC. Uh, this is one that I'm going to go ahead and link because I just think everybody should go through this because there's a lot of individual slides that were pictures were from GDC and there's a lot of really good info from a lot of the stuff. We're not going to go over each and every single one because there's just so much of it. 
uh especially like the sales data it's funny how much that graph looks just like mine different numbers but like almost identical super spike day two lower spike and then just like taper off so like there's a lot of good stuff here i'm just gonna go ahead and link this and uh you guys can check it out all right next step into the pixel exhibit calls for submissions of game art this i found super super cool so this the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences and the Entertainment Software Association announced that the annual Into the Pixel Video Game Art Exhibit is now accepting submissions for its 16th collection. As explained in a press release, the 2019 Into the Pixel Collection will premiere at this year's E3, taking place in Los Angeles from June 11th to the 13th. Video game artists and developers interested in submitting their in-game or concept art, including character, environmental, landscape, or other artwork used in the creation of games, for consideration can do so until May until Monday, April 29, 2019. So if you guys want to submit your game for an art exhibit, which I think is great, I don't know how much of a chance indies have to get in here because there's some really kick-ass, um, you know, AAA artists. But I, th I, I think this is really cool. I think it's about time that we have art exhibits for game art because there's, there's – like you don't realize how much work it takes to make game art – and it's about time that game artists get recognized, like 3D artists, epic 2D artists, crazy pixel artists, great, like all of this amazing art is going to end up in a in an exhibit, and that's fucking awesome. I think that's great. You know, I think we should support stuff like this, even even if you don't submit. Next up, Sony is pulling digital PS4 games from sale at GameStop and other retailers. This I found interesting, and let me tell you why. Last week, we talked about how Xbox is working on a discless console. If you remove the disc from a console, you are removing retailers' ability to sell your games unless they sell digital codes. And now we hear that Sony, Sony is pulling the digital code sales from GameStop and other retailers. So now, now granted, this is two different companies. It's Microsoft and Sony. But she got a discless console coming out, which which effectively destroys the used game market and removes most retailers' ability to sell games at all. And now you got Sony pulling the digital codes from these stores. This seems like a war on retailers. This seems like Sony and Microsoft are trying to take control of the uh, the game sales here. They're trying to take it into their own stores. This is uh, this is interesting to me. I find this super, super interesting. And and the memo came from GameStop, which is interesting. GameStop has released a memo that says Sony is no longer allowing retailers to sell digital versions of full games. Those interested in buying digital games from the GameStop or unnamed other retailers will have the option to buy a prepaid PlayStation store card. But codes for full game downloads will no longer be available. So I'm going to go to GameStop and buy a prepaid PlayStation store card for the amount of a game. And then I'm going to go on the Sony store and buy that game with my prepaid PlayStation store card? How the fuck does that make any sense? Just go on the store and buy it. So they're like, they're trying to like, oh my God. That makes, <laughs> just for gifts, just get, what? you can gift games on PlayStation, can't you? And it starts April 1st. So, but they're still going to allow digital add-on content via GameStop, just full games, which is weird. They don't really say why. Your mom isn't gonna figure that out, but she could buy a $20 card, yeah. It's just, I don't know, that that seems like it's got some shady purpose to it. You know, like, I don't know. Like, like both Sony and Microsoft, I see making moves to take control of the sale of their games, you know? which I, we're in an interesting state of the industry at the moment. They're trying to make it inconvenient on purpose. Yeah, that's that's what I see. That's what, Discless, same thing. I mean, they're they're parading it around like it's the convenience. Like, they like oh, it's so convenient. Just order online. You don't have to go to the store. But in reality, they're cutting out your ability to go to the store. At least, I'm talking about Microsoft when I say that. But Sony, um, they're kind of doing that too, just to a less degree. Strips you of choices, yeah. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about that. 
Next up, Fallout 76 and a handful of upcoming Bethesda titles now headed for Steam. I found this interesting because of the recent Halo announcement coming to Steam. All right, and now you got, I mean, nobody really cares about Fallout 76 at this point. I think, uh, you know, I the, the, the gamer nation gave their opinion on how we feel about Fallout 76. But Bethesda titles now coming to Steam, I think is interesting. Just like Halo coming to Steam. That blew my mind. So now you've got bigger, bigger companies bringing their titles to Steam, which could bring more players to Steam. I wonder what's going on behind the scenes. Like, I wonder if Steam is pulling some shit like Epic is like Epic is clearly trying to get their their um, exclusive titles. Right. But what if Steam is actually going out to these other franchises and saying, hey, we'll give you some some cash to get your stuff on or we'll give you a percentage that's smaller. Or bigger. You know, like there might be some stuff going on behind the scenes here that we don't know about. Because I find it interesting. These guys have their own launcher. Why that they can get 100% of the game price of. Why would they bring it to Steam? Uh, unless there's something else. I don't know. Maybe maybe Microsoft paved the way. I don't know. Maybe because Fallout 76 sucks. They're just bringing all their shitty games there. They're like everybody else is using it as a dumping ground. If Epic keeps pulling exclusives like it is, Steam needs to bring in stuff that hasn't been on PC before. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, it might be a behind-the-scenes kind of thing. Like, Epic's trying to get new games to launch exclusively there. But Steam seems could, like, pull existing franchises. I don't know. Maybe it's just... Maybe Microsoft came up with the whole Halo idea. I don't know. But I just... I think from a business perspective, like... If I ran Steam, that would be a great fucking idea to partner with Microsoft, even even if I take like a 1% cut, right? Halo is one of the biggest franchises in gaming, and if I could get their whole audience uh, onto my platform, even if I have 90 million active users, right, I would fucking do that. I would, I would make them a special deal. They're feeling the pressure from Epic? I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. So we'll see. Maybe we're reading into this way too much. <laughs> we're taking the title and just fucking twisting the shit out of it. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Next up, Twitch Prime users are being gifted a free year of Nintendo Switch online. If you uh, you got a Switch, you got a Prime account, you get a free year of Nintendo Switch online. Twitch is treating Twitch Prime subscribers by giving them a 12-month Nintendo Switch online subscription for free. Part of Amazon Prime, which costs $12.99 per month, given an annual Nintendo Switch online package only costs $19.99 a year. It's probably not a great deal unless you're already on Amazon Prime customer, but for those already signed up, it'll be a welcome extra. Yeah, I know Nicole was really happy about that. She uh she has she has both Amazon Prime and uh Switch and Switch Online or whatever it is. And she was like, yeah, free money. Next up, Nintendo to release two new Switch models in 2019. This was interesting because Rumors of an updated Nintendo Switch are circulating again, but this time the Wall Street Journal claims Nintendo is working on not one, but two new Switch consoles. According to the Wall Street Journal, which claims to have spoken with people familiar with the matter, Nintendo will release one version of the machine with enhanced features for those who want to upgrade their Switch experience and another cut price console aimed at more casual players. With regards to where each device will fit in Nintendo's current console ecosystem, the stripped back Switch has been pegged as a successor to the aging 3DS. With while the enhanced version will entice hardcore fans in the same way as Xbox One X and PlayStation 4 Pro. This is interesting. To reduce costs for the cheaper model, Nintendo will reportedly remove the vibration functionality from its Joy-Con controllers, largely because there aren't many games being released that make full use of the techno technology. It's unclear what else Nintendo plans to change. There aren't any hints uh, when it comes to pricing either. Answers to those questions might be around the corner as both consoles may be unveiled at E3 2019 and could be on shelves a few months later. I read that one is going to be mobile only and one is going to be like hardcore like Xbox One X. If they made a mobile only Switch, I might consider that shit. I mean, I don't think Nicole has played her Switch on the TV since she bought it. It's been like six months since she's never played it on the TV once. So... I mean, that's kind of what I would use it for anyway. It's like a mobile console. Like, is the dock thing cool? Sure. But, like, do most people use it that way? 
Next, Comcast plans to build a $50 million esports arena in Philadelphia. Uh, I know everybody loves Comcast. They're like one of the most loved companies in the United States. Uh, and <laughs> they're building an esports arena. This is interesting, man. Esports is esports is blowing up. Esports is like becoming bigger than regular sports. I don't have numbers, but like, yo, we're, I mean, video games are no joke anymore. You know, it's, it's interesting that a company would build a $50 million esports arena. Like that's got to show some sort of demand, you know, esports are, I would love to see esports on less, uh, I don't want to say less AAA games, but like less, like look at all the esports games. They're like highly competitive multiplayer games, and I guess they have to be, but I would love to see some sort of competitions and esports competitions on some smaller titles. I don't think that's a lesson here. I just think we need to, like people like watching other people play games. It's like a thing now, and people can make fun of it all they want on these late night talk shows, but... Dude, I would love to see Super Bowl numbers, man, because these numbers are no joke. Esports is blowing up. Hyper Light Drifter Dev confirms a TV series is in the works. This blew my mind, man. Hyper Light Drifter, an indie game that came out a couple years ago, 2016, I believe, is getting a TV series. This, this is breaking ground here. This is breaking ground here because you can get a successful indie game these days and end up with a TV series, which can end up making you way more money than you're getting. Well, maybe not in their case, but because that game did really, really well. It was arriving on Switch in 2018. Hyperlight Drifter is receiving its own TV show led by developer Alex Preston as a producer Addie Shankar, who is best known for creating Netflix adaptions of Castlevania and upcoming Devil May Cry. So it's actually getting uh, somebody that's familiar with video game adaptions. Man, like video game movies and TV shows don't seem to be received very well, no matter no matter where they're at. I think I think the Tomb Raider movies are pretty good. I was never super into Castlevania games. I played them once or twice, I think. Actually, were they were they on the the Game Gear? Because I think I played them on the Game Gear. Or one or two of them. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Why do you guys listen to me? Next up, Klifsky, the creator of Positech Games, which is a dude that I really look up to and admire, released uh, a blog article called Why I Skipped GDC in 2019. And what I found super interesting was... He pretty much listed all, all of the things that I was ranting about last time um, all about GDC. San Francisco, like, one, it's super expensive. It's just there's a lot of shit that goes down there. Money, $2,499. Uh, nobody is getting paid, the speakers, which is not something I brought up, but that's a really good point. Uh overwhelming majority of talks are of zero use to you. That's exactly what I said about indie games, right? Like most of us don't get anything out of GDC except meeting a bunch of people and having fun. You pay $2,500 and like most, most of us in the indie sphere will walk away from GDC and get nothing out of it. I mean, other than like connections and networking, uh, you may well get ill or suffer in other ways. Yeah. There's a lot of people I get. I, I, I don't know the, them people them human beings I don't know about that um yeah so I I believe everything that he says I really 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 um resonate with him a lot on this I I think GDC is cool and it's growing and it's massive and it's probably great for AAA and stuff but like w w my experience there is like walking around the expo talking to some publishers and stuff making connections with people that part was cool but like most of the talks are like triple A to triple A. That's really all they are. Like they, they're not really relevant to most people. Um, and then they're so fucking expensive, man. And even if the tickets were free, San Francisco is an expensive ass city. So just to go there for most people is hard. 
So, like I said, I, I want to see if there's something we could do to help out Indies with that. For sure. I would love to go and just check it out. Yeah, it's... Yeah, dude, when I... In 2016, when I went to GDC, it cost me five grand. Total. With um, hotel, rent-a-car, uh, flights, pass, everything. It was, it might have been like four something, but it was like between four or five grand. And that's, and that's me living in the United States. Can you imagine if you don't live in the United States or you don't know anything about it or you've never been to San Francisco before, right? <laughs> or like you have, there, there's so many different reasons. Yeah, so. You could do it for cheaper, I'm sure. But, but the, the passes alone are half of that. $2,400, $2,499. Most of the good talks end up on YouTube. Yeah, their their YouTube channel is, is great and it's fantastic. But like I said, even most of the talks on the YouTube channel are like not really relevant to most of us indies. Uh, okay, so we with our first Reddit post, someone by the name of The Doozy Mang posted, why do many gamers feel entitled to piracy? And they go on to say, I saw a post today where a game developer said that piracy caused a devastating hit on the profits. The post got downvoted several times. A gamer then replied with reasons why piracy is justified. When I was younger and didn't get paychecks, I pirated stuff, a lot of stuff, games, music, movies, you name it. Now that I can afford it, I don't pirate as much. I'm not a perfect angel, but at least acknowledging one fact. And then he lists, they list a couple reasons doesn't matter if it's a nonviolent crime. It doesn't matter if the company is rich. It doesn't matter if the DRM experience sucks. It doesn't matter if digital content can be copied easily. It doesn't matter if you just want the demo of the game first. It doesn't matter if you're broke. It doesn't matter if the content is available. It doesn't matter if you were going to buy it anyway. Not telling anyone to stop pirating. I'm just tired of gamers saying things like, you solve piracy by making better games. No, that's sick and twisted thing to say to someone who invests a massive amount of time in a product. So I agree with everything this guy says. None of this stuff uh, justifies piracy. But I don't personally feel like the war with piracy is winnable. Maybe that's a pessimistic view, but it's my view. I, I don't think I can write superior technology for the crackers. They're going to crack my shit anyway. I don't, I don't think I could possibly invest enough time to prevent them from cracking my shit. That's number one. Number two, I don't think that I could give them empathy enough to like support independent creators. Come on, guys. Don't steal our stuff. No, that's ignorant. Don't do that. No, that's ignorant. Buy my stuff. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, so I've kind of just like, you know, like accepted that fact. I've accepted that fact that my shit's going to get pirated. And I don't actually think that piracy hurts sales. I really don't. I've pirated stuff before. I think anybody who says they never pirated stuff is a fucking liar. Okay. Anybody that grew up in our period in the 90s, in the 2000s, if you say you didn't pirate shit, you're a fucking liar. I'm sorry. Everybody's done it at some point. Right. Um, but the thing is, like, a lot of the stuff, if I ever pirated something in the past, I, I really, 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 I don't think that I was going to be a purchaser of that thing, right? I don't think that they lost the sale by me pirating it because I don't think I would have bought it anyway. Right? I, It's not theft. It's piracy. Information like games and music have different properties and physical stuff. I, would I like nobody to pirate my games? Sure. <laughs> I'm all about it. Please don't pirate my games or my albums. Let's, let's not do that, okay? Give me money for them. But am... Am I going to advocate piracy? No, 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 no. It's illegal. It's against the law. Don't do it. But do I believe people are going to stop doing it because I tell them to? No. Do I believe people are going to stop doing it because I make that make it slightly more complicated for them? No. I think everybody's done. Everybody got quiet because I said that and everybody fucking knows. Okay. Everybody fucking knows they've done it at some point. So they can lie and act all mightier than thou all they want. But everybody fucking knows at some point an MP3, an image some shit okay some shit got pirated but th no that doesn't make it right that doesn't make it legal that doesn't make it okay that doesn't make it anything but 
I just I I don't think it even justifies the the amount of effort that you would put into it because I don't think that allowing someone to pirate your game not allowing them but having someone pirate your game if you prevent them from pirating it i don't think they become a customer okay i don't i don't think that if one person pirates your game you lost one customer i don't think that's appropriate but that's my opinion all right next up we got a post from daca 102 on reddit where they listed the best developer talks from GDC or otherwise. And this is another one of those uh, content drops. Lots of cool stuff uh, from, they got links to various different talks, uh, animating Dauntless, improving the culture of critique, board game design day, autonomy, mastery, purpose, which I actually really like this talk, quest for progress. And obviously this is somebody's opinion, right? These are all people's opinions, but, but, here are all of the uh, links, and I found thought this was a useful resource. So, if you guys want to check that out, you can do so there. Next up, we got another opinion by NMKD, Reddit user NMKD, uh, that Patreon is a much better way of monetizing your game than selling it, both for you and your players. Now, the reason why I share opinion posts is because I feel like it's a good dis discussion topic. You know? Uh, so NMKD says, I often see posts or sometimes talks like on GDC about how lucky you have to be to really sell a good bunch of units on your game on Steam. I personally have a different approach for earning money with games. All my games are or will be free and I have a Patreon with some advantages. But I have one rule, no full exclusivity. That means no games are behind a paywall, not even any levels or features. Currently, my only Patreon benefits for early access, shoutouts, advertising. Just with that, I built a community. I have a 1.5 years, make 600 a month from Patreon with a free unfinished game and it's growing faster than ever before. Not only do I have a somewhat stable income, but my players are also happy because any Anyone can play my game as i said the only current limitation is that free users need to wait a bit for the latest features major releases are free builds between that can be downloaded from patreon at four dollars or more per month um all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about the the immediate thing that pops out to me that i think everybody would say in the comments probably say this too but 600 a month after one and a half years of work is is not a whole lot that being said it is a monthly income versus a single time income uh so i like the concept continuous early access it seems like it might be something like that um i think patreon offers a lot of opportunity for up-and-coming creators i think it's really interesting i use patreon you guys know that and I i'm a creator but i focus on developers a little bit more um I find it interesting. It's 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 a new wave of like monetization for creators. My rent is twelve fifty a month, so you can pay less than half of your rent, sketchy. All you gotta do is put in one and a half years of work. No, 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 but for real, like um I believe that there are game developers making an entire living off of Patreon, and I believe it's it's more than possible. Uh, I think it's going to be highly dependent on the developer's ability and the game. I mean, the, one of the problems with Patreon is, I mean, just in general, a lot of game developers suck at marketing. And if you've got to, if you want to do a game launch, you have to do, you know, the marketing up until your launch. And then you're, you're good to go. Minus like promotions and different stuff you do here and updates and all that stuff, which marketing is never really over. But if you have a, a a monthly service like Patreon, you're going to have to be selling people all the time. All the time. Right? And then you're going to have to deal with churn, which is people dipping out and more people coming in. Right? You're going to have to kind of keep that growing somehow. It's a cool idea in theory, but you always have to think about what the system incentivizes, which in this case, I worry that encourages devs to drag their feet developing stuff and never really commit to deadlines and just finish things. I River, that's a really good point. Uh, a lot of the uh, contractors I work with, I work with on a uh, a flat fee basis for that very point because I feel like uh, by our work, most of the time with contractors encourages them to take as long as possible. Whereas a flat fee encourages them to get the shit done 
as soon as possible because if they can get it done faster they can make more money uh so i agree with you in that like you really do have to look at what a system incentivizes and um i think it it depends on like the the way that you do your game right like if you have a really personal brand if you have like people like you and they like your creative process i think you could span a patreon across multiple games and i think that would totally be fine um if if everything is based around the game, yeah, when you launch that game, it's going to be kind of weird and awkward, right? You still have to be able to drive new people continuously to Patreon, though, similar to launch. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. That's like a continuous marketing process versus a, a single marketing process. $600 a month is not something you can live from, though. Yeah, I think that's why that immediately jumps out. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but it's definitely not livable in the United States. Um, you'd need, I mean, you could, you could quadruple this and still be in what's considered the poverty level in the United States. What do you think about rewardless Patreon campaigns? I don't think those would work. I guess it would depend on the person. Uh, I don't know why you would do that. There's you, uh, reward people. Why not? Would the Patreon method work for developers that release new games per month? I would keep it interesting. The user would be able to market something different to a specific. I think I think there's a way to make it work. I would like to see. I, someone is going to come along and make this work. I know they are. One game a month or some shit like that. And like, I think this could work with scale too, right? Like, what if? What if you do make one game a month? The games are ten, twenty dollars on Steam, but if you pet pledge a dollar a month, you get all the games. I think at scale that would work really well. You get a hundred thousand people to pledge a dollar. Now, granted, hundred thousand is going to be really fucking hard to get that many people, but in theory, the volume would make up for the you know the way that it works. I think you could pull it off. you make a team of like three or four developers and do this together it could be cool i like i said someone is going to do it right I, I i can promise you somebody is going to figure out how to do this i haven't even really figured out the whole patreon thing i need to get better at it i really i need to give my patrons even more stuff because they uh support what i do and they help me out so much and i have been looking into ways where i can help them out much more but even then my patreon my growth isn't I'm not really growing, to be honest. I'm kind of just like stagnating, at least for the last year. And I don't, I don't shout it out much on Twitch or YouTube at all. Like I really don't. I don't advertise it much. It's in all the links in the description, but nobody really goes there. So, um, you know, I, I think, could you do it? Yeah. I, I don't know what the right way for a game developer to do it is, though, because like my, my own angle is more like um, trying to help out developers rather than like people subscribing for my games next up epic game store spyware tracking and you now this was submitted uh in by the discord one of our lovely fellow people uh in news and events submitted this and this is about how epic games is going through all of your data and spying on you who likes to be spied on raise your hand who likes to be who likes to be spied on? Who uses Google Chrome? Where I'm literally being spied on, like as exactly, exactly, Cobra. Any anything on the internet, you're fucking getting. We're getting spied on twenty four seven. So do I believe that Epic is is going into your data and poking at all kinds of stuff? Yeah, I hundred percent believe that. Uh, and this is a massive post that I'm not going to go through, but basically, there's a lot of specific evidence on how Epic is literally feeding into the data the applications you have installed the different things you're doing and it's it's recording all that i i would imagine that probably uh, most of this is in the eula the end user license agreement that they can do your data and all that work on a completely offline pc do you really epic stuff does this for crash reporting not sure it's necessary well 
there's some evidence here of it poking it. I don't, first of all, I don't think any of it is like, how can we fuck over people or how can we, you know, I, this guy goes into their heavy ties with the Chinese government and all that. I don't think it's some kind of conspiracy theory. Do I think they're collecting data about applications you have installed and potentially the applications that you use and all that? Yeah, I, I a hundred percent believe that. I, and I don't think it has anything to do with like some kind of conspiracy with the Chinese government. I think it has more to do with, Hey, what games are working? Where are these people using steam instead of us? Why? How can we make more money by serving them more games that they want? You know, like, I, I think it's a hundred percent business focus as most data gathering is. 100%. Epic TOS is atrocious. I never read it, so I wouldn't know. Release games for free, build in all spying tools, collect everything you can, sell it to some shady guys. I actually released a blog post. This was years ago. Uh, it was like 60 some ways to monetize your game. And one of them was sell the data. And it was just ideas of like how to monetize your game. I'm not advocating that you sell data. But, dude, people got angry about that. This was before I was even on YouTube. And I remember posting it to Reddit and, like, people were like, you're advocating selling people's data? Rah, 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 rah. Like, no, motherfucker, it's just an idea. Calm your shit. Calm yo shit. Calm yo shit. You can sell my data. Okay, give me some data to sell. Apple fritter for little critters. What's your favorite little critter? I'm going to use this as data to sell right now. My favorite little critter is a warrior chinchilla. Okay. Who wants to buy some data I got on Apple Fritters for little critters? Who wants to buy it? We're going to auction it off. You guys ready? False. Oh, we already sold it. False bracket with the 10 biddies. You get the data. All right. Here's the data, false bracket. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share it to you, okay? Here we go. Fucking selling data in this bitch. Here it is. Here it is. False bracket. We fucking sold apple fritters data in this bitch epic can fuck off because we're, we're selling data right here live okay it's it's great false thank you for buying that data from me you could call me a data broker now that's what you could call me i'll resell it to epic <laughs> no just install the client on your computer all right next up next up ea lays off 350 people in marketing and publishing and more the only reason I bring this up is because, like, I find it interesting they're laying off marketing and publishing people. Okay, like, developers get laid off all the time. But marketing and publishing people is really, really interesting because it seems like a company like EA would be heavy, heavy, heavy into uh, marketing and publishing. So, the video game publisher Electronics laying off 350 people in marketing, publishing, and other areas. The latest move in what's been a brutal year for game industry. In an email to two employees obtained by Kotaku, EA boss Andrew Wilson said the goal would be to streamline decision making in the marketing and publishing departments following a console consolidation that began last year, improve customer support, and change some of its international strategies that move includes closing offices in Russia and Japan. We have a vision to be the world's greatest company. He wrote, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not there right now. We have work to do with our games, our player relationships, and our business. My guess is that Apex being the successful project, but Anthem flopping made management wonder what's wrong with their marketing. You know, that could be a, that's a really good point, River. Um, Apex had almost, like, I'm seeing marketing for Apex everywhere now, but that's only because EA was like, oh, it's working. Let's ramp the fuck up on the marketing. Uh, at first, they didn't do anything. Okay, so I've seen this mound, but I don't. I haven't actually done any research, so I don't know what this is. So we're gonna learn about it together. How about that? Uh, the internet is all flutter today over the vote on Article 13 by the EU Parliament. Far and wide, articles have decreed that the new legislation, which aims to update copyright law in Europe, many have argued that the enacting Article 13 will ruin the internet. Prominent figures in the tech industry, including inventor of the World Wide Web Tim Berners-Lee and the Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales, have signed an open letter condemning the idea. But what is Article 13 and will it really break the internet? As one might guess, Article 13 is the 13th article in a lengthy titled Proposal for Directive of European Parliament and the Council on the Copyright Digital Single Market. Okay, that's what it is, boys and girls. That's it. What is Article 13? It's the 13th article in the lengthily titled Proposal for a Directive of the European Parliament of the Council on Copyright and the Digital Single Market. That's it. That's what it is, in case you're wondering what it is. Basically, if someone uploads a copyright material to YouTube, YouTube itself can get sued. Oh, okay. Thank you, Gnome, for saying in one sentence what it takes them 10 paragraphs to say. Uh, 
Article 13 would force sites and online platforms to use automatic tracking technology to detect when users uploaded content to make sure they weren't sharing copyrighted material. Currently, the onus is the uploader to ensure the content they are sharing doesn't breach copyright law. Article 13 would make online platforms responsible for ensuring this. Yeah, so that's kind of dangerous. Um, I can see how people might be upset about something like that. So th wasn't there something like this in the United States? Was uh, not SOPA, but like wasn't there similar stuff that would make things um, make people responsible? And it it's dangerous because literally anybody can upload something. And I mean, it, it's, it's complicated, especially with stuff like memes, right? Like you take a meme, it, you take some image from like Lord of the Rings and you put words on it and you distribute it on the internet and it makes people laugh and it's a funny thing to do. Is that technically ownership of the creators of Lord of the Rings? right uh are you breaking the law by distributing that image who owns that image do you own it because you created it you took a screenshot um memes have been exempt okay but i'm sure there are videos and stuff too that that could walk the line like yeah if you upload a movie to youtube you're you're you know you're breaking the law you should know you're breaking the law at this point but what if you do like movie movie reviews and you have a couple seconds extra of uh, of footage in there, right? Memes could be confused by the filter, that kind of stuff. Um, who really owns memes? How does all that work? Isn't it similar to the fair use argument that's been going? Yeah, it is. Um, it would be global because if they hit YouTube, it will change the algorithm. So it's best. Easiest thing to use globally. The companies with the responsibility will make the easiest thing a global thing. Well, there's that recent data thing with the EU too. Like you have to disclose the data you use and all that stuff, right? Stuff like this scares me. I don't want my internet to change for worse because of all the crazy shit out of touch politicians trying to impose on us. Net neutrality stuff in the US to this. This will trickle down worldwide. Yeah, I mean, I like the internet the way it is. Does a lot of bad shit happen on it? Sure. Does a lot of technically illegal stuff happen on it sure but there's a lot of good that happens on it and the the lack of regulation i think helps people freely share ideas and information in a way that you couldn't share on any other platform and if you start regulating it if you start like even if youtube had a thing where they have to scan every video the like you know where where does that end one, what if I want to get a video out right now and they have to take two hours to scan it? Two, what if what if they're wrong? Like, you know how many times YouTube is wrong now? You, you, know I mean? you see all these posts on Reddit about people getting demonetized and shit? Like these companies claim, claim copyrights on your music and shit? And then you can't do anything because they're a big company and they put a copy strike on you. What are you going to do? Re you repeal it and then they're like, nope, fuck you. And then, oh, well. YouTube is totally perfect. No, YouTube has its issues. Like, dude, just for, like I post shit on YouTube, right? And I know like when the whole Disney thing went down, when Disney pulled all their ads over some dumb shit, it cut my revenue in half like three months ago, like two months ago. Just one day, ads just dropped in half. Bye-bye. So as a creator, that kind of sucks, right? That like, that sucks that I'm doing the same content, the same thing, but just... Revenue gets cut in half, but also like the, I went through the whole demonetization thing. That fucking sucked too. YouTube would demonetize all kinds of videos for a while. It was demonetizing every video that I said the word fuck in. If I said the fuck word, it would demonetize my video. And I, I tried it over and over and over again and it would demonetize anytime I said fuck. So now like I'm not allowed to say a word that I want to say, I want to say fuck. What? That's stupid. Like, why? Why? Why is that a rule? I don't think it's a rule anymore. I think it was at a point, but I don't know. I'm probably taking this way out of context. Talking about the reasoning for large movement of regulation of the internet by politicians. Yeah, it's getting a power struggle between countries and companies. It's getting to the point where there will have to be a second internet on dark servers just to get creativity out in the world. Yeah, that would. I hope not. I hope not. Uh, I just like, 
you know, these companies are faulty, right? And they don't, any, any creator run or person run company is going to make a shit ton of mistakes because they have to deal with millions of people. But then you, sh- you throw in stuff like this where stuff has to be scanned and it has, and it's the responsibility of YouTube one. I don't think there's any perfect way that any content platform could ever regulate the volume of content that they get ever. I don't think that's possible because people are going to find some weird fucking way to like, you know, weird filters on images or like they're going to do crazy things with the video. Not without extremely smart AI. And even then, I think there's going to be a margin of error, but it's going to be different kind of errors. Uh, no, but so, yeah, I I, th- I think it's bad. That's my opinion. It's bad. Anything that changes my internet is bad because I don't want the internet to change because I like the internet the way it is. Uh, and then even if I did agree with stricter regulation on copyrighted material being uploaded to sites, I still would say that I don't think these peeps that pass something like this understand the complexity of that task. Just saying, yeah, you let up people upload shit to your website. You got to you got to uh, write the technology and build it all yourselves to stop them from breaking the law. I don't think those people understand how complex that problem is. OK, I don't I don't really think they don't understand the scale. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't think they understand how fucking crazy complicated that is. Okay. They don't even understand how hard it is for in PHP. If you write a script to crop an image, that shit took me like two weeks to program. Okay. Just crop an image. So people don't upload five megabyte, 400,000 pixel images on their profile picture. Like years ago when I started, when I started programming, it took me two weeks To make an image crop. Can you imagine if I had to figure out how the fuck to... No, man. No, thank you. All right, everybody. That's all I got for you today on the Dev Report. Uh, We'll have another one for you next week with all the cool stuff that goes down this week. Make sure you tune in to to see that. And uh, we'll be back. Make sure you hit the thumbs up and the subscribe button. I got to do all the YouTuber stuff, you know, because hit the thumbs down if you hated this video or my face. I'll see you in the next one.